gentlemen, we're going to lighten it up just a little bit here. Uh, not completely, but after the last two <laughs> segments, and just enjoyed watching the Facebook debates go back and forth in regards to rights and who can grant a right. And, and they are active. The context in which those rights were granted. They're active, but they're always very courteous. Very engaged. Very engaged. Our guest in this segment is Delegate Don Forst. About six months left in Don's term because uh, he was defeated in the recent primary, May the 14th. Don, good morning. Thank you for coming in. Well, thank you for having me. It's our first chance to talk with you since the election. Uh, you look back on the May 14 primary and the months leading up to it. Is there anything that you would have done differently? Yeah, I'd have taken some of the negative stuff more seriously. I didn't think people would believe a lot of that stuff. As I mean, this is there's been several negative campaigns this last cycle. I think mine was the dirtiest and lowest. Now, I got Craig, uh, and the things they got him on were lies as well. And he had some big outside money against him. Mm -hmm. I had local big money. <laughs> I think I, my opponent outspent me two to three times. Yeah, ex Don, very quickly, you're talking about negative toward you. You, yes. were not, you did not engage in negative campaign. Actually, I tried to stay the other direction, yeah. focus on issues and the, what we need to do. And uh, looking back... <laughs> Try not to bump that table again, Tom. <laughs> looking back, I think I should have taken some of that negative stuff more serious, but I didn't think anybody was that gullible to believe some of those crazy things. You were called a groomer uh, yeah. in one of the ads used against you. You know, and that would, some of the stuff got totally personal, and he warned people to keep their kids away from me. And I'm thinking, well, that's pretty low. I mean, who would believe anything like that? But evidently, some people must have. When you're running for office, obviously, it's kind of fair game because of what the rules are. But when you hear some of the ads that are out there, and some of the things that you were referred to as, for instance, a, a groomer, what's your reaction and what, what are your options? Well, that's a good question because th as near as I can tell, libel rules are totally different for people in public life. Mm -hmm. And so, but I'm not sure if, if it, there must be some limit somewhere. You can't knowingly just tell lies. Most people stretch something about a law that's passed or a voting record or something. But then at some point, when it's a total fabrication, th there ought to be something there. And I'm not sure if there is. I don't, I haven't, nobody's told me that there's a recourse. Did you, when you heard the ads uh, or, and saw the, the mail pieces or whatever, did you uh, contact the, the candidate you were running against who was uh, involved in some of those ads? Uh, no. Actually, I had, almost, I had absolutely no contact with him. I did on a couple of forums, and one of yours was one of them. It was mm -hmm. about the only time I ever saw him. And even that was a little surprising. He's quickly, he's not dumb. He's quick on his feet. He lies through his teeth. He lies to my face. I mean, accusing me of stealing his signs. And when he was challenged by the other opponent about her science going, he fabricated a story right on the spot about, oh, it must have been those students helping me. You know? And I'm thinking, boy, he's fast on his feet. I'm not as fast as that. I have kind of think things through and move with determination and, you know, and forethought. I'm not, I'm not one of those people that come up with these things just right off the top of my head. The third member of the of your candidates since this past time, Tammy Hess, also <laughs> felt that she was a victim of some very negative, very personal campaign. I yeah, I'm not sure if I saw all of the stuff that came out. I did get a fair amount. Uh, the ones I saw, con you know, with her, I felt were more mild. No, I'm uh, I, I'm talking about being directed toward her. Okay, yeah. Being directed toward her, yeah. Com comparing her to the vice president and mm -hmm. not too serious mm -hmm. person, mm -hmm. I think, is the nature of the slander against her. Uh, but he didn't accuse her of things like being a groomer or keep kids away from her, things like that. Yeah, so, but you're right. He, it's, it's interesting that he picked on her, too, because my th understanding was some of the people were supporting her to take votes from me to give him a better chance. And some of that's allegedly back to somebody I ran against in the past who wasn't too happy. John? So <clears throat> what, were the, what was the venue that was most damaging to you, do you think? Was it, was it Facebook? Was it 
with social media that that was hurting you were you were you kind of blindsided do you think were you were you hit with with advertising venues that you just weren't prepared to counteract well i'm not big on facebook and but friends reported a lot of it to me so i was aware of it you know and some of that started almost from day 1 you know almost an instantly started a whisper. did you counter punch not Directly, some of my friends counterpunched. I mean, I wasn't going to get in an arguing match with him. I didn't think that would be productive. But the, some of the people did challenge that what he was saying about stealing signs and all that stuff. A few of the people that were doing it, well, it was mainly him. But then uh, one of the other delegates' wives actually claimed she saw me stealing signs. I said, that's crazy. How could she do that when she lives at the other end of the county? You know, so you just wonder about people and what they pick up on and pretend they know about. Don Forrest, our guest here on the program, he is a delegate from District 91. And uh, when they change over in January, that'll be uh, somebody else's seat, depending on the outcome of the general election. Don, as you look back over your time in the House of Delegates, what pieces of legislation do you hang your hat on the, and you say that you're happy you were involved in? Well, okay, I actually prepared a cheat sheet. One of my high priorities was economic development, and I supported everything there. I didn't initiate this legislation, but I supported it 100 percent because I felt strongly that that's the bedrock of our, our state recovering. I mean, when I say recover, I mean from our glory days way, way back to where we are now a few years ago and where we are today. I think we're on the road to recovery. I think we're doing well. The economy is coming up. The, the, game with surpluses is I think it's a bit of a game but we are doing well there's a taxes are up businesses are doing better when you say taxes are up you mean revenues yes I'm sorry right. you haven't you, had a, <laughs> you didn't raise taxes while you're in did you no uh, my opponent accused me of one it was one little thing we changed a percentage of something from like 0.14 percent to 0.16 percent and had to do with an adjustment to have federal matching funds so we didn't lose a grant and that was blown up to how I raised taxes on medical services. I think so. That's you know, and people don't, that don't know what's going on or understand things believe that kind of stuff. Yeah. And the other thing it wasn't pointed out. I think it was a hundred percent of people voted for that because you know, it was something. We, it was a no-brainer. It's something we had to do. So. Now this past. Uh, term we saw you mentioned Craig Blair being defeated uh, the governor is out uh, he'll be possibly the next senator so there's a changeover of leadership and power in two of those three uh, levels of the legislature two of those three branches are you expecting in August that it'll be a rush to push some things through uh, to make sure uh, that the governor might want to make sure that he gets certain things funded or uh, Craig Blair might want to make sure that certain things are, are finished before his term is done that's not easy to do. We, c we can't operate, and that's one of my big problems with the legislature. We can only pass legislation during the 60-day session. Mm -hmm. During the interims... But you can spend a lot of money that's left over between now and then, though. We can, but that has to do with the, the thing about how we allocate out the surplus. Mm -hmm. and, that, and being honest, that's all pre-spent. People, there's a list of things waiting to be funded out of the, uh, out of the excess. Uh, there will be one, possibly one more special call of the governor to do a little bit of final year-end. I can't. It's going to be too late in August. Uh, I think it's the deal's done. What's there is there. It would take a special call of the governor to change things, but we're in the new fiscal year after, I guess, what, end of June, 1st of July. Yeah. And the next yeah, interim session is August. So there's very little that can be done this year to play games with anything. You have another one in October, I think, do you not? Yes, and in December. Now, generally, they're every month except the two summer months, and, of course, when we're in session. Yeah, okay. What are some of the things that are going to be funded in, in August, Don? You said this uh, this $800 million, $700 million surplus is already pre-spent. What are some yeah. things that highlight that? Well, okay. Uh, there, I guess a lot of things that people count on year to year, I mean, it, it's – I'm not in the finance committee, but so I watch it from the outside a little mm -hmm. bit. And, of course, we all vote on the final bills. But what I understand of it, there's literally, I'm going to say, 
dozens if not a hundred or more items that are sitting waiting for the exact amount of the surplus and they kind of get funded in a priority order and so that money spent it, it doesn't nothing gets wasted nothing I don't know if that's the right word. <laughs> well, wrong word. <laughs> Nothing gets unspent. <laughs> Nothing gets unspent is probably the better way to put right. it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, during your time in office, what's something that you wanted to get through that you were not able to get through? Well, there's a couple of things that are they're in process. One of my constituents had a problem where his wife was killed in a, not exactly a hit and run, but, uh, oh, uh, they call it vehicular talk right mm -hmm. vehicular homicide right. where you kill somebody with a car and uh turns out that's a misdemeanor in West Virginia and you probably heard the joke what's the best way to get away with murder in West Virginia use your car yeah. <laughs> there's a study going on now i initiated one bill didn't make it it was they didn't want to create more causes of action so there's a study going on to see how other states deal with this issue of, of how you would handle vehicular homicide. And probably the way it's going to end up, is, and, if the, and there should be some legislation coming out next session, would be give the prosecutors and judges more discretion and have the penalties overlap between the, the, the different levels of the charge. Not create new causes, but give the judicial system a little more discretion to deal with things properly. Mm -hmm. So that was one thing. Uh, the another one I was really kind of keen about. Uh, we did we did a lot of good legislation to protect kids and protect protect them from non-reversible surgery and medications uh, while they're minors. When adults can do what they want, and adults do a lot of crazy things, but kids aren't mature enough to make the decisions. And sometimes things happen, and by the time the kids old enough to do something themselves, statute of limitations run out. They can't go back against the people that commit a crime. Not just medical. It could be somebody taking care of their state or financial or whatever. A lot of things that happen to kids when they're young can't be fixed later because they can't sue because the statute of limitations run out. I wanted to introduce a bill, and I've talked with some of the law, legal people there, to extend the statute of limitations that uh, not exactly stat start it when a kid reaches majority, 18, mm -hmm. and give them six years to d deal with any legal issues they felt where somebody cheated them, stole from them, or damaged them or hurt them. And that applies not just to s sex change, but other medical procedures. Uh, there was a, another bill in process that was almost the same, except it was dealing with medical issues. Uh, somebody was damaged seriously, handicapped from it. Their parents never sued, and then the kid's now an adult, and she can't sue from from an accident where somebody actually did hurt her. So I think this is something that we we'll probably will get it cleaned up. I wasn't the only person working with this, and I'd like to see that get through. It's an interesting concept. Y yeah, because we do. Kids are our future, and a lot of times we don't. That's just one way we don't take care of them very well. Bill? I mean, <laughs> there's other ways, too, but mm -hmm. that was one of them. Yeah. Uh, other things that, uh, okay, that one. Uh, well, education, uh, actually, I'll lead back up. Rural health and certificate of need. That was a real hot button with me. Uh, we, the reason we have less medical services in rural areas is it's too expensive to set them up. Uh, you can do it for low level, practice level, but you start getting into anything where you need a hospital bed or anything, you have to get a certificate of, of need, which means you end up having lawyer's fees, application forms, a lot of expense, and then the people that already have those certificate of needs challenge it. So then you end up in court several years trying to show that you need more medical services in an area. And I think the whole system is stacked in favor of the big big medical groups who have these certificates keeping newcomers out and that's got to be addressed they would run those bills a couple times uh, last time it was a colossal failure it was amazing the strength of the big hospital associations of killing anything that was going to hurt the certificate need now we have chipped away at it in the past and I hope that it continues in the future because 
that's one of the big problems in this state is, the, is we have some of the worst health things in the country. That's a, and that's because of some of the legislation, no, we shouldn't say legislation, some of the bills that are on the books prohibit new people entering the field where they're needed. Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, before you move on, I know Bill had a question for you. Bill, yeah, uh, <laughs> are you grouping the hospitals and organizations such as hospice under the same umbrella for certificate of need? Hospice, well, I tell you, I'm very familiar with our local one. I've talked with the director in the past. I think she's now retired and moved on. Our, okay, a lot of that is controlled by uh, Medicaid and Medicare. There's a lot of rules about how they reimburse people. The problem is some people provide the service, provide minimum care just enough to bill the government and don't provide some of the services like our local hospice does. I know, I've know people that were volunteers at our hospice and I've, we've had meetings there. They have a nice meeting hall. They provide services well beyond just the minimum required by hospice, uh, by, hospice by the government, Medicare and Medicaid. And so, this groups like that, we do need to protect them because they have community involvement and they really serve the community well. They're not just there doing the minimum they can to bill. So this is the f we've t we've had this discussion before. <laughs> That's the first time I've heard you say there should be a carve out for organizations such as hospice. Yeah. And so you've changed your mind over the over the last year or so. Well, not totally changed my mind. I never was for getting rid of hospice. I'm against. Uh, certificate of need in a broad sense where it's just uh, if we do okay we can modify certificate of need piecemeal because you realize that's really not just one thing there's about 20 maybe 25 30 medical procedures covered by it. they cover it procedure by procedure uh, if we do get rid of most of the certificate of need there's a few things should survive under a different umbrella and not be lumped in with just what I think is a misuse of, a, of, of laws on the books. John, you get the final question for Don Forst. What's next for you? <laughs> uh, well, the rest of the year, I'm on committees. I'll show up and do my part, make sure we have quorums on the committees. Uh, that's, the, we're in the part of the year where there's not much happening. There's no legislation being done or generated. And so... I'm basically getting back to my normal life. <laughs> I wasn't planning to make politics a career, but I was going to, planning to go one more term. Uh, it's just a would you like to be part of a Morrissey administration, assuming he gets elected? I would like to help out. I'm not sure if I want a full-time job. I would be glad to help out, collaborate, consult, and whatever. Because I, I think he's a good person. I think he will do a good job. Uh, I, would, I would definitely help out for sure. Uh, and, uh, well, so many other people got in. I mean, this last election was interesting. Uh, it, something that I want to point out that we... Yeah, 30 seconds. Go oh, oh, I'm not sure if I could do it 30 seconds. We lost a lot of good talent this last year. Somebody tallied up the number of years of service. We lost Charlie Trump, Craig. Uh, we lost... Householder. Uh, Householder. Hardy. Uh, uh, Hardy. Yeah, and so... That if you add up the years of service and the people that, that are really supporting Eastern Pan, they lost a lot of good people, and it's a shame. Don, thanks for coming in. Well, thank you for having me. I know you have another six months to go, just about, but uh, your next chapter in life. Good luck to you on that as well, sir. Appreciate it. Appreciate your availability through the years that mm -hmm. you've been in the House of Delegates. At uh, time to take our uh, final two-minute break here.